our LASIS lunchtime lecture series, and that is going to be presented by uh, my uh, great friend Lucia Melgar, and uh, it's going to be focused on women's voices, new approaches to Mexico's human rights crisis. And I've already mentioned Lucia is an old friend of mine, and not just one of many friends, someone very important. Um, when I, we were both together graduates at the University of Chicago. Lucia was a couple of years um, older than me in terms of hierarchy of arriving to the graduate program. So I always looked up to her. Uh, everybody was looking, in fact, up to her. She was uh, always um, answering every question that was being asked in the correct way and she read all the books that everybody at the, uh, this uh, high program knew. And then on top of that, she got the job as a professor at the Princeton University. So she was really our role model and someone who, uh, who we really admired. Um, but having the option of staying as a faculty Princeton, Lucia have chosen to return to Mexico and uh, lead academic work in connection with activism, getting very engaged in uh, political and social issues, especially those dealing with uh, women's rights. And um, apart from being a teacher and organizer, uh, Lucia has a weekly column in one of the Mexican most important newspaper, El Economista, where she writes about education, politics, um, arts, uh, use of gender, obviously, also about children, about violence, and even uh, narcotraffics. Um, she also wrote a lot of uh, courageous articles about uh, femicides, um, for uh, which she was risking her personal safety. And um, recently I was invited to participate in a conference on human rights uh, in Mexico where we had sessions in which uh, up to 200, 250 people were connecting in Zoom. And just to uh, give you an idea of how important Lucia is in this uh, movement in Mexico, I can tell you that the session would not start until Lucia would connect. They would wait for her to, to be there. So Lucia also published a book about, a couple of books about an important Mexican writer, Elena Garro, together with Maria Mora and also uh, um, by herself. Uh, so um, I have in front of you a very um, admirable kind of academic and activist, someone who devoted her life to struggling on both intellectual and, and political level for the issues that she believes are um, worth of it. So without getting more time, uh, I would like you to welcome um, Lucia Melgar. Thank you very much, Kata, for this uh, very excessive presentation. I, I also admire you and I, I cherish you as a very good friend of mine. Uh, we have been kept in touch throughout these, all these years. And I would like to thank both the Human Rights Program and the um, Latin American, uh, Caribbean and Iberian Studies Program and all, all of you who have uh, come to Listen to these talks. I will um, start and, and, and without further uh, explanation so we can at the end have time for questions. Since 2010, Mexico, Mexico has been ravaged. I will just turn off my, my phone because otherwise I cannot. Since 2007, Mexico has been ravaged by devastating bouts of extreme violence. Murder, femicide, massacres, or displacement have ravaged people's lives in vast regions of the country. Men, women, and children have been victimized by organized and disorganized criminals 
and state armed forces. Women and children especially have also endured family and domestic violence. Coupled to human rights violations and insecurity, Mexican society has slowly, has slowly normalized violence in such a way that even extreme violence has, increased, has been increasingly tolerated, if it, even if not justified. This situation reminds trauma specialists of conflict zones. People lead their daily life in abnormal situations which have become normalized. Perhaps the psychological effects of such accumulation of traumatic events have, has not yet been fully appraised. Normalization of violence is a symptom of serious degradation of social life. In this context, point and, pointing at violence against women as a specific phenomenon is not an easy task. However, since the surge of cruel murders of women in Ciudad Juarez in the mid-1990s, which led to coming uh, to coining the feminicidio, that is, to refer to uh, brutal murders of women, guilt for the sole reason of being women, academic writers and uh, journalists have given more attention to women's experiences of old and new forms of violence. By this, I mean common manifestations of misogyny, such as sexual abuse, harassment, and domestic violence, and on the other hand, abuses such as feminicidio perpetrated by organized crime, big appearances, and human trafficking for sexual exploitation that have become more prevalent in the last 25 years, particularly since the so-called war against drugs was declared at the end of 2016. 2016 sorry. The devastation caused by this failed strategy against cartels and by the expansion of military presence all over the country can be synthesized in official numbers that do not, however, transmit the intensity of pain imposed upon thousands of families. More than 200,000 five homicides, 35,000 of which women since 2007. More than 60,000 men and women disappeared. Dozens of massacres directly directed mostly at young people. More than 300,000 displaced persons forced to abandon their homes because of criminal violence. These, number are, these numbers are outrageous. They do not allow, allow, however, to apprehend the social and psychological effects of what some consider a form of necropolitics, that is, politics of which determines some people are irrelevant and can be disposed of through violence, misery, or state negligence, among them young people, women, and migrants. More commonly, they are seen as indicators of the human rights crisis, even by the high degree of impunity, which reach between 93% and 98%, according to experts. This explains why at least five cases of egregious human rights abuses were by the Inter-American Human Rights Court in the past 10 years. Most of these cases refer to violence against women and state negligence or direct violation of rights femicide, raped by members of the army, police, sexual abuses. While sociology and political science are useful to contextualize human rights abuses, discrimination, and gender violence as part of a wider system of oppression, literature, journalism, cinematography allow us to, to examine a more personal and intimate side of this phenomenon, the experience of living under violence and surviving it. In this talk, I intend to present some of the ways in which women writers, filmmakers, journalists have treated violence, particularly against women, and resisted sentimental or revictimizing approaches. I will also present a brief overview of, of women's movements against violence and human rights abuses. Women mobilizations have slowly become central, particularly in the last decade, to draw about questions on the women play in society and on their place in the public space. This space, traditionally restricted for women until the late 1960s, approximately, when women in universities and the workplace became more common, is still a dangerous zone for them since discrimination, harassment, and insecurity prevail. Thus, demonstrations organized, led, and attended by women are read as transgressive actions 
that contribute to resignify women's roles and place in the public space. First, I will talk about how literary and journalistic approaches have come to show violence as something that is embodied, that is, they show bodies in pain and talk about the experiences of these women um, abused by all sorts of violence. Social problems and violence have been a recurring topic in Latin American literature. The novel of the dictator is probably one of the best known subgenres within and outside the region. Mexican literature shares this trait. The Mexican Revolution was an often fictionalized episode in the 20th century. In more recent years, many male authors have dealt with drug trafficking in novels and short stories. Unfortunately, some have reproduced with the stereotype of traffickers as successful men surrounded by wealth and beautiful women. These images, because narco corridos or popular ballads singing narcos lives, which tend to trivialize the destructive effects of outcomes. Similarly, male writers have tended to minimize the harsh treatment of women by organized criminals or previously revolutionary troops. Even before women writers won a wider readership in the 1990s and expanded the subjects they dealt with, some of the predecessors had made important contributions to the representation of violence against women and women's experience of social conflict. Among them, Nelly Campobello, Rosario Castellano, and Elena Garro, uh, writers who were not led by a concern for human rights as we might consider them today, but who were sensitive to women's condition to the plight of marginalized people. By 1931, Nelly Campobello had been one of the most original fictional accounts of the revolution in northern Mexico. Her collection of vignettes in Cartucho, Tales from the Revolution in Northern Mexico, presented the viewpoint of a child surrounded by revolutionary violence. The naive and curious perspective of this child narrator conveys the naturalization of extreme violence during the war. In its 1960 second edition, it also vindicates women who participated in the armed conflict as soldiers and were forgotten by official discourse and historiography. In the early 1960s, before the so-called boom brought to the front writers such as Carlos Fuentes, Rosario Castellanos and Elena Garro published novels that might have had stronger repercussions, but not the traditional canon prevailed at the time. Although a feminist, Castellanos was mainly known as an indigenista writer for her works, for her works set in Chiapas, in which she represented and condemned the oppression and violence imposed on indigenous communities. Her novels, however, especially Oficio de Tinieblas, also show the dynamics of misogynistic practices and beliefs. A significant trait that her contemporaries um, ignored and which, on the contrary, has attracted 21st century readers for whom the connections between sexism and racism are more obvious. Elena Garro, on her part, also approached and represented oppression and violence toward rural communities, marginal, marginalized people and women. Her novels and early plays were where violence is central, are more powerful than other works of the period. As she blended a masterful prose, an original imagination, and a keen understanding of the dynamics of violence as a multi-level machinery in which the social, economic, ethnic, and gender factors are all related. Thus, in her novel Recollections of Things to Come, published in 1963, she fictionalized the post-revolutionary period in East Epic, a small town in southern Mexico, occupied by federal military troops, where officials and a powerful landlord imposed an oppressive and corrupt regime. As conflicts between the federal government the towns and the townspeople increase, violence engulfs the town. Throughout these conflicting times, women's are, women are drawn as survivors of various forms of violence. Kidnapping and rape during the revolution, prostitution of different sorts afterwards, and always inequality, discrimination, and oppression, as well as social control. Violence becomes so intense that in the end, the town is ruined and desolate, but the potential heroine of the failed resistance is degraded into a victim of unrequited love and turned into a stone. As a site of memory, however, this stone is the secret story of the people's resistance to federal troops. Both Castellanos and Garro give voice to common women and suggest how institutions and cultural expectations enclose them in oppressive relationships and roles. 
They also suggest the bodily restrictions and suffering endured by women, but they do not explore them much further. The presence of the female body as a constitutive element of being and society, and not only as a, an object of desire, is a more common trait of innov in innovative women writers, mainly in the 21st century. Violence as a crucial experience in women's lives has more deeply been examined by younger women authors who have integrated femicide and disappearance in the poetry or fiction. For example, in the book El Silencio de los Cuerpos, The Body's Silence, that's the title, a collection of short stories by nine women authors, violence becomes embodied in the pain inflicted by femicide and suffering, however, is not represented in the graphic and even worse style some main authors and journalists often favor. Violence is neither hidden nor exposed in its totality. The murder of a mother by her partner, the sister's disappearance, the rape and killing of a niece are told through the recollection of the relatives' lives. They are perceived and felt by the reader in the weight of absence, the feelings of loneliness, despair, fear of those whose lives have been suddenly broken apart by this brutal process. Fear of a lonely ta woman taxi driver whose partner has been killed by a criminal group when she realizes that she will be the next victim and her wish to be promptly shot, expressed inspired by torture and rape, which have become common practice in areas dominated by organized crime. As the journalist and writer Sergio Gonzalez Rodriguez wrote in Rollock to this collection, these writers go beyond and, um, and write an effective narration of femicide and punity and abuse. They suggest possible ways to understand the motives of femicide, the impact of violence. They avoid representing women as victims to be pitied, thus contributing to prove to the possibility of thinking critically about violence. In so doing, they illuminate the psychological consequences of violence and loss, an angle that is often eluded in more graphic representation, as if the tearing apart of families' daily life and dreams irrelevant. In a country where social tolerance towards violence has increased, extreme violence is even depicted very crudely, with excessive details in the media, journalistic photography, and even a few journalists. So that some public has gotten used to seeing images of torture studies, reading about cool rapes and torture, a narrative that hit, hit you in the face, but do not give you a chance to breathe. In such context, the best in, to, in such context, excuse me, the best narrative journalists, mostly published by women authors, and some of the, mo of the most recent documentaries filmed by women directors are particularly significant. Telling the daily life of common people, exploring the dark secrets, secrets and hidden complicities involved in family violence, by signifying women's search for just a collective heroic act, which leads to building solidarity networks. Opens, opens up an artistic space where readers and readers can better understand the dynamics and effects of violence, its psychological consequences, without feeling overwhelmed and powerless. Although there are exceptions, the best women filmmakers and journalists in recent years have chosen not to represent violence graphically, but rather to insinuate it, to suggest what is happening off screen, and to let the audience imagine the fact. This decision, for it is something that cannot be attributed to chance, contrasts with the brutal representations of femicide or extreme criminal violence offered, as above mentioned, by media photographers and reporters, but also by some TV shows, many videos on the web, and some authors who argue that violence must be shown. In my view, the spectacular, spectacularization of violence by the government and the media over the decade has already shown the Mexican public more than it needs to see about human cruelty and torture. As the feminist scholar Mariana Berlanga has suggested, suggested in her study of on femicide representations through photography in Mexican media, rude representations of female semi-naked or simply exposed corpses reproduce the victimization of women as the camera fixes them from above, from a patriarchal uh, and freezes them in a passive, subordinate position. In the worst cases, media images also eroticize the dead, exposed female body, trivializing the murder even further. 
Contrary to this perspective and attitude, filmmakers such as Tatiana Hueso in her documentary Tempestad and Lucia Gajá in Batallas Intimate Battles let women tell their experience, their stories of survival under state and criminal abuses or domestic violence in order to share the horrors they lived through and the means they found to overcome daily torture or death threats. In Tempestad, Hueso blends the story of a woman arbitrarily named and sent to a jail, controlled by a very violent criminal group, and the tale of a woman who has spent 10 years looking for her disappeared daughter. The first testimonial line is the most striking. Miriam, the protagonist, recalls the time she spent in jail as a visit to hell. More than fact, she expresses her strong emotions, terror and oppression, as she realized that lawlessness prevailed in that remote prison. Rather than showing, Miriam herself alludes to facts and expresses her own feelings and thoughts, thus immersing, immersing the audience in a charged atmosphere. For example, when she mentions that at some point she was ordered into a room where the criminal leader and his accomplices were, the spectator can imagine what Miriam endured there. In order to emphasize the state responsibility for human rights abuses, Peso frames both stories in an eerie atmosphere where words such as justice and freedom lose meaning. She also presents the audience, especially female, the female public, um, prevents the audience, especially the female public, from becoming passive spectators who of atrocious acts, and thus allows them to sympathize with me, Miriam, as a survivor and a fighter and unveil the state's collusion with crime. Similarly, in intimate battles, Gaha gives voice to survivors of domestic violence who remember their nightmares and hopes, but also the means they found to escape from femicide threat and rescue themselves, and in some cases, their children. To their voices, Gaha tells battle women that they are not alone. She also invites the to reflect on the causes and dynamic of male violence and to examine its own participation in the reproduction and social tolerance of such abusive practices. In these and other documentaries directed by women, individual stories are exemplary tales of human rights violations in which state agents commit direct or tolerate abuses, while high levels of impunity prevail in judicial institutions, especially regarding sexual violence and crimes against women. Far from empty rhetoric, they make a statement for justice, women, and equality through the stories they collect and share by emphasizing the effects on violence of women and children, their families, and communities. Women's stories become indictments against the judicial system, the armed forces, and the police, and overall, the state negligence and responsibility. During the so-called men war on drugs, Many people were falsely accused of belonging to organized crime or working for them. Tortured on the, until they accused themselves, exhibited by the media, and in some cases released later without further explanation or accusation. Many more were murdered, kidnapped, or disappeared during the 2007 to 2018 period. And the war goes on. Telling the war from the victim's perspective and bringing to light the potential for resistance of communities and individuals has been one of the main contributions of Periodistas de a Pie, a group of mostly female journalists, some of which are the best specialists on long-term coverage of atrocities, such as disappearances, massacres, femicide, or criminal violence. In their most recent collective work, Daniela Rea and other women journalists writers and photographers belonging to this collective, we recover women's experiences on the consequences of criminal violence in their own life. Uh, the title reads, Ya no somos las mismas, y aquí sigue la guerra. We are not the same, and the war goes on. And it has been published a few, like two months ago. This book illuminates the flow of threat, shooting, extortion, extortions, kidnapping, and arbitrary imprisonment that many women and their families have endured in different regions of the country up to now. They also tell how they have been changed, defeated, traumatized, hardened by these experiences, and often address the need to tell their stories so that these facts are not forgotten or hidden by official history and speeches. 
As journalists who have lost many colleagues to violence, since Mexico has become one of the most dangerous countries for this profession, the editors have aimed at creating a truly collective work. They recuperate in one of the uh, stories the painful situation of women journalists threatened or killed by criminal and state agents who must leave their children alone and go to work, or who must leave their town or state to escape death. They also document the forced displacement of women and whole towns. People who flee to save their lives and often leave empty handed. They also reconstruct individual stories of common people, such as Lucy, a working class woman in the industrial town of Silao, Guanajuato, who, after resisting for many years, was forced to pay extortion money in order to save her life and be able to remain close to her family. Lucy felt defeated as if she had been too weak. Um, by giving, giving in to these uh, criminals. Such abuse stories and tales of resistance and others remind, reminds us of the many mothers and sisters of murdered or disappeared women and men whose loss transformed them into human rights advocates, activists, or teachers who worked surrounded by shootings and faced by children who admire narco culture, teachers who still believe in the power of education. These times of isolation, such books and films remind us that the movements for justice, human rights, respect for the law and gender justice may not be visible right now, but have given hope to millions. These common, common resilient and resisting voices must be vindicated against discourses that preach family values and promote women's submissive acceptance of domesticity, which often includes violence. I will now turn to um, feminist movements, uh, which I call, in, 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 in which are led, uh, especially by young feminists, as a rejection of patriarchy and its false promises. Social movements in Mexico. I will try to move. Social movements in Mexico have customarily erupted in the public space, demonstrations, graffiti, and other public manifestations denounce injustice, express demands, and mobilize both sympathetic groups and public opinion. The feminist movement has a long history of mobilizations through demonstration, open letters, lobbying, and manifestos, a means of which women have fought for the right to vote be elected, for abortion rights, and since the late 1990s against femicide, harassment, disappearances, and domestic violence. Impunity that characterizes the justice system has been a common target of women's and other social group protests, since it constitutes an aggravating factor of human rights violations all over the country. Although I have previously mentioned the most egregious human rights violations in Mexico, for clarity purposes, I'd like to highlight femicide as one of the triggering factors of women's mobilization since the late 90s. First, we must remember the outcry surrounding femicides in Ciudad Juarez in northern Mexico, an industrial town just opposite El Paso, Texas, where women's labor increased in the 1980s, mainly in precarious conditions of the maquiladoras or assembly manufacturers. Young women, mostly poor working class, started disappearing and were found murdered days or months later, after having endured sexual violence and torture in cases. Researcher Julia Monares examined this phenomenon over several years and distinguished between different forms of femicide, what we have come called feminicidio, among which a specific one that she called systematic sexual femicide, which refers to murders of women preceded by kidnapping, rape, torture, and followed by the exposition of the corpse in public spaces such as dumps or vacant lots. As Monares argues, this process entails a reification and dehumanization of the victims, which reinforces the already dehumanizing process imposed by the exploitation system of the maquiladori industry. Monares has demonstrated as well that there, there is a fetishization process of the female body in the way it is sexually used, destroyed, and publicly exposed. This kind of femicide corresponds to approximately the third of the more than five or 500 murders perpetrated between 1994 and 2005. 
then constituted a frightening message for all women, especially as a state at all level, left this and other many thousand crimes have been unpunished over the past 25 years, not only in the North, but all over the country. Although Mexican society was slow in accepting the seriousness of this problem, activists and women legislators succeeded, succeeded in bringing about a discussion that led to the legal inclusion of the term feminicidio, which was later in, inscribed in the penal code as a specific type of murder. Feminicidio is understood as the murder of a woman for the fact of being just as femicide in English, but it also entails the, the state's responsibility as it does not systematically punish it. Beyond judicial and legislative discussion, the prevalence and impunity of femicide led mothers of victims to organize demonstration and collective searches for, for the bodies of their daughters since the late 1990s. Mothers were, were key in attracting national and international interest in a phenomenon that federal authorities still consider myth by 2005 and to keep it visible when the bloody effects of the war against drugs and overshadow. In a parallel movement, the plight of families of disappeared men and women was brought from the local level to the country's capital, Mexico City, in 2010-2012 by mothers who have since held yearly marches claiming for justice for their relatives on May 10th, which is Mexican Mother's Day. Just resignifying this special date as a reminder that for them and many other mothers, there is nothing to celebrate. Moreover, these women and their families have organized collectives that have learned to search all over the country for graves where bodies or body parts of murdered people have been thrown into criminal groups. They have, in fact, undertaken a task that the Mexican state should be doing. And um, by now, um, people count around 2,000 massive graves in Mexico. For some time, these two main demands for truth and justice remained separate and were seen as distant causes by public opinion. Mexico City inhabitants particularly tended to see the city as an oasis of peace in a sea of violence. However, as violence in the uh, peripheral in the periphery, specifically in the state of Mexico, increased without any serious government plan to prevent, to prevent it or put a stop to it, feelings of insecurity became more acute. Violence against women has currently reached unprecedented levels in the capital. According to the most recent national survey of violence in women's life, in 2016, Mexico City held the first place with more than 66% of women 15 uh, and over having experienced some form of violence in the past year and throughout their lives. The state of Mexico, which is just nearby, ranked second. This survey includes violence in the home and schools, workplace, and public spaces. All sorts of violent practices are reported. Psychological, physical, sexual, economic violence as well as harassment and insecurity in public transportation streets. Such intense violence in women's daily life ultimately led new agents to take the street to voice their protest. In 2016, various collectives of young women, many of them university students, organized the first massive demonstrations against street harassment. April 24th was the, the starting point for young feminist actions and demonstrations against what they consider patriarchal violence. The most relevant feature of these mobilizations, which are part of a wider trend, is that it has finally channeled a diversity of groups towards a common goal, the fight to stop all violence against women. Seeing the various manifestations of violence as facets of the same social problem contradicts the fragmentary narrative told by the state and the media. Protests, consequently, point at its responsibility and demand serious action to prevent and punish gender violence and to uproot machismo, which is a very difficult task. However, state institutions have remained either indifferent or negligent to these demands. Both previous and the current administration have offered little more than promises. First, since 2019, 
current government has tended to deny the impact of domestic and criminal violence on women and girls, and has limited or eliminated resources previously used to respond to women's needs, such as shelters and childcare facilities for working mothers. This background may explain the dimension and impact of the March 8th feminist massive protest in the capital and other cities, and the significance of the women's strike held on March 9th this year. Thousands of women, 200,000 or more, took the streets in Mexico City alone and transformed a usually dangerous public space into an arena for feminist demands, chants, singing, and dancing, where younger and older feminists converged towards the iconic Zócalo, the country's main plaza. In contrast to the peaceful and joyful celebration of April 24, 2016, this one was disrupted by seemingly well-synchronized black dog groups, which damages, damaged some buildings with Molotov bombs and scared the least experienced demonstrators. Such actions may be read as an attempt by government officials to break massive demonstration or as part of the strategies adopted by some radicalized sectors who call themselves radical feminists or anarchists. Such disruptions, however, did not diminish the significance of what represented the reappropriation of the public space by women of all venues who gathered to express how fed up and tired they are of normalized and tolerated machista violence and state abuses. This massive gathering was followed by a strike plan to draw public attention to the views of women. This strike emptied the streets of many cities in an eerie contrast to the previous day. Both actions represented the confluence of women's struggles which had not previously, previously found a common space. We cannot yet speak of a conscious coordination of causes, but this convergence can be read as a result of an increasing awareness of the links amongst the diverse manifestations of machista violence under a patriarchal system where we, women are still undervalued, underpaid, and more easily exploited and killed. This gradual confluence of women causes in the public space has been accompanied by the adoption and adoption of symbols that have slowly entered the social imaginary, the same process with which women uh, with which mothers of young murder women in the north marked the sites where their daughter corpses were found, or which painted the light post of Ciudad Juarez and other cities as reminders of femicide. The colorful, colorful murals, uh, sorry, the colorful murals depicting and celebrating the lives of those young women which lighten up decaying streets and neighborhoods in the north were reproduced in other regions such as the state of Mexico by young feminist groups. These symbols were adopted and adapted as meaningful vehicles to commemorate the lives of them and to remind municipal authorities of their obligation to justice. Embroidered panels on which the death or disappearance of men and women are recorded through collective craft were present in massive demonstrations for peace in 2010 and have since accompanied the mothers of the disappeared, as well as well as, well as mobilizations against femicide or harassment, serving as moving murals where traditional craft becomes a means for remembrance. Such artistic symbols demonstrate women's resilience and creativity in the midst of adversity, two traits that characterize the transformation of women into human rights defenders. Becoming a human rights defender has not been an easy transformation for relative of men and women murdered or disappeared. However, beyond the, the pain and fear imposed by unpunished tolerated violence, the search of thousands of women, old and young, in the persistent search for justice and truth cannot be understated. Similar to the mothers of Plaza de Mayo, yet mainly belonging to a lower class, the mothers of murdered or disappeared women and men have politicized and reconfigured reconfigure the role of mothers so central to traditional male culture and society. Like their predecessors, they have transformed their pain into collective action. To give an example, the 2015 Supreme Court determination that any violent death of a woman must be investigated as feminicidio resulted from the painstaking efforts of Irinea Buendía, a working class woman 
refused to believe that her daughter had committed suicide, as the authorities said, and for five years demanded that the violent partner her daughter had decided to leave the day before be investigated. Similarly, legal, legal advances to prevent and punish violence against women were first promoted in the context of femicide in modern Mexico and have been made possible by the simultaneous engagement of women legislators, NGOs, and victims' colleagues. The challenge remains to force officials who apply this law but the contact the fact that these laws exist enhances the legitimacy of women's struggles for justice. Today, women's rights activists face significant challenge, challenges, mainly to create better communication and coordination amongst the many groups that might constitute the movement. What we see today is a diversity of movement, movements or groups which unfortunately are at times divided by lesser issues or cannot establish a fluid dialogue across less or more radical positions and also class differences. This is even more crucial today on March 8, as the consequences of the pandemic have hardly hit Mexican women. The impact of the, I will now not expand on the impact of the pandemic because I think I don't have more time. But um, I can tell you that in spite of uh, the lockdown, uh, violence has increased in the domestic sphere as, as in other countries, but it, also, it has also increased in public spaces. Um, the problem is that the current situation has, I would not say that it has halted the feminist struggle, but it has um, trans trans transported it to the virtual space which does not have the same impact, in, although it, it is very useful. Uh, so I think that um, right now we are faced with a very dark uh, perspective. But however, uh, and, and, and that women and women organization and activists face very significant challenges. One of these challenges is to strengthen ties among each other and to imagine how to more channel the potential for resistance that the March 8th demonstration suggested. The task is not only to unite or link women's causes, other struggles for equality and justice must be integrated, including the less vocal migrant populations who are seriously being hurt by militarization, the submission to US policies, and the health emergency itself. I cannot extensively deal with the migration conditions here, but I would at least point out that serious human rights violations are being perpetrated against them with the complicit silence of the countries of origin and the, and the vocal or tacit of the United States government. The most shameful development in a country that aims to promote human rights worldwide and, and which has signed all sorts of conventions does not, does not act accordingly. And I'm referring to Mexico. In conclusion, I would say that women's struggles for justice and regarding women's human rights violations have followed a long and difficult path. They have not succeeded in stopping systemic institutional and social violence, but they have been able to expand awareness of the harsh realities experienced by Mexican women and girls. Moreover, through artistic works, writers, journalists, and filmmakers have brought to light the more intimate face of violence pain and hopelessness caused by torture, rape, and the loss of lives through femicide and disappearance. They have also brought to light the strength and resilience which have allowed survivors of such horrors to recover their lives and to give testimony to their plights. Many women narrators have contributed to uncover the invisible wounds left by violence and to open a way towards understanding the dynamics and effects of violence, which may be left aside when one only or mostly stands as a passive witness to barbaric violations of human rights. Art and collective actions are sites of memory and struggle. They are also sources for hope. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Lucia, for this uh, impactful lecture. Um, I will invite in public right now to uh, type their questions in chats. 
Um, and um, just as you guys are thinking about your questions, uh, which I'll read from the chat uh, for Lucia, I, um, I wanted to ask you, Lucia, you talked about the um, organizations right now that are thinking about connecting better to make uh, all the violence against women more um, known to the general public. Um, are there any uh, demands uh, and suggestions of policy changes that uh, these organizations are considering that you could comment for us on? Well, um, is there an echo? There is a little bit of echo suddenly appeared. Okay, let me let me turn off the computer. Sorry. Um, can you please repeat the question? I'm sorry. Yes, you, you mentioned uh, that the organization, the feminist organizations right now are thinking about connecting back to let people know about, to make the public aware of the violence that's happening against women. Uh, are there any suggestions for the policy changes or for uh, some um, steps that should be taken in the situation of COVID that would is this violence that would help to act against it, prevent it? Yes, there are groups that are uh, educating the public on this violence through the web, and mainly they they are uh, they are insisting on previous uh, suggestions. I mean, they in in terms of the of the pandemic uh, situation, um, they have demanded that the state. Um, strengthens strengthens uh, shelters and uh, through giving them more money that they expand um, emergency emergency services such as the ones that were um, um, put in, in, in play, into place especially in, in, in March and it is not they are not really making new demands it's like insisting on previous demand. The problem we have now is that if uh, previous governments did not uh, act according to all their um, according to their obligations uh, in, instituted in international conventions or Mexican laws, the current government has adopted um, a very anti-feminist, I would say, uh, discourse in the sense that uh, the president has insisted on the um, the power of the family that the family is a fraternal one that mexican families are special that there is no violence there so they there is not a real uh, government interest in um in really uh, facing all this violence with uh, integral integral policies so in this sense it's, it's like we are going back to many years ago and we have to start again uh, repeating the same uh, propositions that were made be before. One of them, for example, was the need to change education in public schools and universities so that um, machismo is not taught in, school, in schools themselves. So that would be one, an, an example. Right. You already mentioned that uh, with the COVID pandemics, the violence in uh, households and also in outside this is increasing. Uh, I have a question here from Greg. Uh, if you could expand a little bit on that. Yes. Uh, as in other countries, uh, violence in the home has increased because people are living in very difficult times. Uh, and so if they already had conflictive relationships, they um this being being locked down uh, locked up um, they are uh, increases the tensions and the stress etc uh, some women are trapped with their with uh, violent partners who used to uh, to abuse them before so they are and they are not they don't have the same uh, access to uh, let's say social networks that might help them out or they don't have so many so many opportunities 
to denounce these partners because the judicial system for some months was closed or and only used for some specific emergencies. In terms of the violence outside, I, I was I had hoped that this would change a bit since not so many women in, in the streets, but unfortunately, there, there, there have been murders uh, on the streets. Uh, recently, a 13-year-old was who was walking to the market was um, kidnapped and, and, and murdered and, and brutally, very brutally murdered in, in a small uh, town in Guerrero. And there was also a case of a, of a young uh, woman who was raped in her own house. So what happens is that in some regions, we have criminal groups who are the dominating force in, in, in those spaces. So they, they do as they like. They take women, let's say, as, um, as if, the, if we were in, in, in war, in a war situation where, where women are, are, are seen as uh, objects of, of, of abuse. And the state is not uh, present or not as present as it should be so that this uh, violence uh, cannot really be uh, stopped or, or prevented. As I'm waiting for Oracle more questions because we still have minutes, um, I wanted to uh, connect with what you just said about the political and social conditioning of these murders, as that especially those famous ones, that Juarez, Femicidios, um, there are a lot of theories about, you know, who and why. You uh, you hinted that it could be connected to drug violence, uh, that it could be connected to the dynamics of the sweatshop uh, work in those cities. Could you could you expand a little bit more about who and why? Uh, how do you see the uh, dynamics and logic of these murders of women? Well, uh, when these murders started in Ciudad Juarez and, and a few years uh, afterwards, um, specialists, local specialists uh, particularly, uh, explained them as part of a system that dehumanizes people and uh, especially women who were, who were the main uh, workforce and, and a very cheap labor force. Um, they also pointed to the presence of the Juarez cartel at the time, and they attributed many of these murders to such uh, to criminal groups. However, there were also journalists who um, argued that um, if there had only been cartels, the state would somehow done something at the time because they, they were not as powerful as they may be now. So they hinted at, um, let's say, more like powerful men in the city who somehow used the women as trophies. And, um, and so this was what uh, it, 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 it seems like a nightmare explanation, but that's, that's what, they, what they suggested. In fact, since there has not been a real investigation of all these cases, we don't really know who committed them. We cannot put names in many of these, on these, of these murders. But what also happened was that violent partners started imitating these very cruel murders. So uh, it became a mixture of, let's say, extreme viol domestic violence and also extreme violence perpetrated by criminal groups and other, let's say, unknown criminals. What has happened over the years is that we have seen uh, for example, during the war against drugs between 2007 and 2012, especially, uh, not only women corpses were, let's say, mutilated and shown on the streets, also um, uh, many corpses of men appeared. So this extreme violence that started in feminicidio was expanded to uh, more general practices in areas where mainly the setas and other very violent groups dominated. At this point, I, 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 it is very um, worrisome to say that extreme violence has become more common in Mexico. So there are there have been murders that have been perpetrated by uh, domestic partners, by relatives who have 
followed similar ways of, of killing than those used by or attributed to uh, to criminal groups. Well, the, the cool, it becomes a cool thing to yes. perpetrate this extreme violence. Yes, yes. In, in, fact, in fact, in there, since there have been videos of torture and, and feminicidios online, some uh, there have been cases where the husband threatens the woman with doing the same to her. I mean, <laughs> there are not, I don't know of many, many cases, but I know of one in Guanajuato, which was reported by, by this woman. Wow. So th th this also th 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 something about the role of media in all this and the way that these uh, uh, terrible crimes are being um, shared with the general public. I have one more question here, uh, probably our last question from Renata. Uh, she says, seeing as the family value oriented conservatorism is trending in so many other countries, as in Brazil, where I'm from, what do you mm -hmm. think are the steps we have to take? as activists and societies? Well, I think that it would be great if families were as fraternal and, and, uh, and friendly as our, our some uh, govern, uh, governments believe. But I think that we have to uh, somehow support women who are in, in, in violent relationships. And at this point, I think we cannot, we cannot expect the state services even if they exist to be as helpful as we would need they we we need somehow to create solidarity among uh, neighbors family members etc to be able to uh, allow these women to escape from these very terrible situations so as activists i, I think we need to insist to, to give information, to give data, to educate the public, and to insist that it is not that um, we are against the family, but that the family is organized in a patriarchal way that tends to, to uh, oppress women who allows for machista violence as well in Brazil as in Mexico and other countries and that women have rights, that women are human beings, and that women must be uh, autonomous and they must be uh, uh, given the, the, the means to exercise and practice this autonomy and to have a more, to lead more uh, their lives with, with dignity and in freedom. I mean, it, it's very vague, but that, that's more or less what I would, what I would suggest. No, I think that the idea that we become conscious that even those friendly families are becoming uh, are the sources of some sort of structural violence on women, even those kind of paternalistically friendly families act towards some uh, uh, violent situation for women. It's, it's a great insight. We should be really aware of that. All right, uh, we don't have more time, so I wanted to thank you to Lucia one more time. Thanks for all the people in the public, and I invite everyone for uh, next week. Thanks so much. Sorry, Kat, I got disconnected for a moment. Well, we are, we are disconnecting, but if you...